Hi, I'm Lisandra Villa, and I'm a staff writer at Time Magazine. I'm joined today by Tamika Mallory, an activist and co-founder of Until Freedom, a social justice group that has been a very close ally of Breonna Taylor's family. Welcome to Time 100 Talks. Thank you so much for having me. In August, Until Freedom announced that the movement would occupy Kentucky until justice was received for Breonna Taylor. You have been in Kentucky ever since, leading demonstrations and doing the work. Being so closely involved in a case like this can take a toll. So how are you doing? How are you feeling? I'm, you know, unfortunately, um, I am probably just numb because of the fact that I feel I have seen this story play out too many times. It's as if I've been a part of a movie, uh, only it is a nightmare, that has been taking place for the 25 years that I've been working within this field. Um, and so there is a sense of numbness. Um, and it's also a sense that, you know, this is to be expected because it's the America we live in. Uh, however, I'm very committed and I try to encourage everyone around me to feel it, not to allow ourselves to sort of sink into a place of, well, there's nothing that we can do. The situation just is what it is and just become complacent um, and not have a sense of urgency. And I think that urgency comes from allowing yourself to process the pain and not to normalize injustice. Wherever it pops up or rears its uh, ugly head, we've got to acknowledge it, call it out, and be able to say that it's not right and we won't be silent while people are being killed and also uh, our lives, and particularly Black women's lives, as in this uh, case with Breonna Taylor, um, are being ignored. I do want to talk about the latest news in the Breonna Taylor case, which is that there is a juror who's seeking to have the transcripts of the grand jury deliberations made public. Um, the, the juror is saying that the Attorney General, Daniel Cameron, didn't give the jury the option of indicting the two officers who shot her. Um, and then the juror is saying that, that the Attorney General misrepresented the case publicly. Um, the, the recording and permission for the juror to speak publicly have both been granted. There has been a lack of transparency um, and, and, and a lack of trust in the process of this case from the start. Mm -hmm. So will having the transcripts available affect that in any way? And, and what do you think that this means for Brianna's case? Well, I think, first of all, it's important to note what the juror has said. He actually or she has actually not said at this point uh, that they were not given charges. Attorney General uh, Daniel Cameron said that in his statement that he released on the other evening. He talked about the fact that they really he that his office only presented one uh, charge uh, for one individual in that case. And therefore, as far as we're concerned, it seems as if Daniel Cameron made a decision um, and his office decided all by themselves that uh, the other officers, John Mattingly, Miles Cosgrove, and also we have to include Joshua James, who is the officer that lied on the no-knock warrant. He lied in order to obtain the warrant that they used to enter Breonna Taylor's home in the first place. And it appears that those officers were not even put on the table or charged charges for them, against them, um, were not even presented to the grand jury. But again, the juror has not said that. It is actually Daniel Cameron who said that himself. What the juror is specifically calling for is not just the transcripts to be released, but that the transcripts be released and that also they would lift the, uh, the, the sort of gag order, if you will, that the jurors are under where they are unable to speak about the grand jury uh, 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 case and, and what was presented to them. And the reason why those two things are important is because the transcripts do not include moments when the tapes were not playing, when things were not being recorded, other conversations that may have happened. And so the, the juror wants to be able to also speak out and the fellow jurors to be able to speak out to tell the story of what happened. Now, the one thing that they did say is that 
what was presented in that press conference that Daniel Cameron did uh, last week is not the same as what actually happened in the room. That's important for us. And I think that this is groundbreaking in this case because the the very uh, capable attorneys of Breonna Taylor's family, attorney Lanita Baker, attorney Sam Aguiar, and attorney Ben Crump, all have said that they did not believe charges were actually filed or given, presented to the grand jury uh, for Breonna Taylor. And um, we didn't have that information. And so this juror's courageousness is helping us to expose what we knew to be true. So I think that when you ask the question, you know, sort of where do we go from here? This is an important step, not just to uh, un unveiling some of the corruption that took place in this case, but also for us to begin the work to figure out how to stop grand juries from being a part of any police hearings and police uh, investigations, because it is out an outdated system that protects police and protects the system and we actually need transparency. On that note of wanting more information, there does appear to be some lack of clarity over whether officers in fact identified themselves before entering Brianna's apartment and how clearly that happened if so. So can you kind of just walk me through what are some of the key areas that activists are looking for further clarity as, as the recordings and transcripts become available? Right. So I think um, it is very clear. What is clear is that of either 12, 12 or 13 witnesses um, have all said that they did not hear anyone respond or, or announcing themselves. So when I say respond, the reason why I raise that is because Kenny Walker, who was inside the apartment, Breonna Taylor's boyfriend, says that they heard knocks and they got up out of their sleep, out of the bed, and they went to find out who is it. So they called out, who is it? But there was no response to Brianna and Kenny's um, question about who was outside the door. The neighbors, all of the witnesses that we have heard from, have all aligned with that. They have all actually uh, been able to give credibility to Kenny's statement. There was one, one uh, I was going to say juror, but actually one witness um, who may be the 13th or the 12th, I'm not exactly sure, but this one witness changed his story the first time, and I believe a second time, he said that he heard no announcement of who was outside in, in the apartment complex area. He did not hear that announcement. Later on, his story changed where he said he did believe that police announced themselves. The issue with that, though, is that this gentleman also says that he went to walk outside of his home to see what was going on. And when he opened the door and walked outside, police approached him and told him, police, police, get back in your home, get back in your home. It is very possible. I'm not the lawyer. I'm not speaking officially on behalf of the family or the case. But it is very possible that when he said that police announced themselves, he was speaking to when he tried to approach the scene to see what what was happening in his apartment complex. And therefore, for us, it is very clear, very clear. In fact, um, in the last few days, we've heard from the attorney for the grand juror who has filed this motion. And the grand juror says that uh, the question came up at some point, I don't know if it was in the grand jury or at a press conference, but the question came up, why only use the one person, not the, the, the 12 or the majority who have said that they did not hear an announcement of the police being there, why only use the one person whose story has changed multiple times? So we're pretty sure of what it is that we're seeing here in this situation. Let's take a step back here just to kind of remind our viewers about how we got here. Brianna Taylor's name is a name that we have heard all summer, but it's in the last week that these national protests have been reignited. And that's because one of the officers was charged with endangering Brianna's neighbors, but none of the three officers were charged with her actual death. Um, I, I know that you're a close ally of the family. Can you tell me what their reaction to the last week has been? Yeah, there's a lot of pain in uh, Breonna Taylor's family. Her mother, Tamika Palmer, is clearly a broken woman. Um, she is broken, but yet very, very, 
very clear that she must remain strong and vigilant in fighting for her daughter. Uh, they are a very courageous group of beautiful people. Uh, however, uh, of course, there is pain. Also, we have to remember Janiyah Palmer, which is Tamika, which is Tamika's other daughter, Brianna Taylor's sister, who actually lived in the house with Brianna, and her room was riddled with bullets. Uh, but she wasn't home that night. So if she had been home, she probably would have been a second victim. And uh, Tamika Palmer would have buried two daughters and not just one. So those realities are really heavy. I can only imagine that Janaya is walking around feeling like she should have been there either to protect her sister or she probably would have given her own life so that her sister did not die. How come it wasn't me? That's a survivor's remorse thing. And so people often forget when we get into the politics of dealing with these cases, you know, we forget that there are real live people uh, that are dealing with these, this, this trauma. Kenny Walker was in the apartment. He watched his girlfriend, his soulmate, someone that was getting, they were getting ready to start a family together. He watched her die. The only thing that Kenny did was try to protect her by firing that one warning shot. And that is being used by uh, the, the system. It is being used by white supremacists online. It is being used by trolls and everyone else to try to make him the villain when in fact, that is exactly what we ask, especially our partners, um, a male partner in your home to do is to try to protect and defend your home uh, and, and, and those who are inside of it. So this situation is tragic, it's very painful. And those of us who have become very close with the family in terms of helping them to fight are experiencing a deep level of trauma at this time. I do want to address some comments that you recently made at a press conference held by Breonna Taylor's family attorney, um, Benjamin Crump. You made some remarks about Attorney General Daniel Cameron in which you called him a sellout and blasted him for his lack of commitment to the Black community. Why do you think that Attorney General Cameron, in your words, is upholding the system of white supremacy? Well, we're watching it play out today. Uh, you know, the, I'm sure there were some that my words ruffled their feathers, uh, but Today, I've actually been receiving phone calls from people, and I've actually watched people on social media begin to say, wow, I now see what Tamika was talking about. It is very clear that Daniel Cameron never wanted to uh, present a case that was a full and transparent case so that the people, the jurors, the grand jury would be able to decide the fate of those officers. He was upholding what he promised to the Fraternal Order of Police, which is the police union. He was uh, the, the national organization. He was upholding the promise that he made to them where he said, I understand what this endorsement means, that I am to be an advocate and a voice for law enforcement. That is what he said understanding the challenges between law enforcement and black and the black community understanding the level of racism that the fop the fraternal order of police has uh, spewed against black folks against every victim against protesters um understanding that to say that you are standing with these individuals you can't stand with uh the majority of the black community at the same time because those two things are in deep deep conflict with one another and so what i have said i stand by because we are beginning to see it play out right before our eyes that he actually stood with the police and he did not do his job on behalf of brianna taylor Tamika, I know that part of the settlement that the family reached with, with the city requires that the police department make some changes to itself, like requiring officers to undergo um, drug and alcohol testing if they've been involved in shootings. What are some of the changes that Brianna's family and, and activists are hoping will happen in the long run? 
Well, Brianna's family has said very clearly that this situation has gotten bigger. It's, it's beyond Brianna Taylor at this point. There's nothing that we can do to bring her back. We can only fight for justice for her. But Tamika Palmer uh, and Bianca Austin, which is uh, uh, Brianna's aunt, have been very clear that the goal is to fight for justice for the Brianna's that are living today, the Brianna's who are home sleeping in their beds, um, hoping that police don't barge in and kill them in the middle of the night. And in order to do that, in order to protect young men, young women, to protect Black folks in general and people who are disenfranchised uh, by the system, there has to be not just reform, but an overhaul of the system. And so the family is very clear that the ban on no-knock warrants is really, really critical not just, well, in Louisville, Kentucky, that ban has actually passed uh, thanks to the work of Katora Heron, who works with the ACLU in Louisville. Uh, she was able, along with many advocates, to get no-knock warrants banned uh, after Breonna Taylor's murder. However, uh, the state of Kentucky has not banned no-knock warrants, so this situation, identical situation, could play out again. Um, and so in Kentucky, that needs to be done. Representative Attica Scott is carrying that legislation and many of us are joining them to push for uh, no-knock warrants to be banned across the state. In the reform package, package that was included in the settlement, there were a number of important things in terms of how warrants are actually signed, making sure that there are high level individuals within the police department checking those warrants and that they are not just an officer able to just make up any lie, maybe run it by a supervisor who's not necessarily looking at the details of the case and go and present it to a judge who signs off without there being any checks and balances. These things have to be dealt with. There's a number of reform items in the settlement. I suggest that people look it up. I think it is incredible and we know it is historic for a family to say not just money settlement, but also there has to be real changes to the police department. How they implement those changes is a different situation and that's what we have to stay on the ground and make sure happens. A lot of people are using Breonna Taylor's death and other incidents like George Floyd's death that have also exposed systemic racism as a tool to motivate people to vote. So what do you tell those who feel that regardless of who's in office, Democrat or Republican, nothing will change? I, you know what I tell them that I understand how they feel. Uh, we've seen how under uh, Democrats, and including President Obama, uh, you had names of people who were killed by police uh, sort of rack up. You know, Mike Brown, which is one of the biggest movements that we have actually seen um, in, in this generation um, around police accountability uh, and police brutality, uh, it, you know, that happened under Obama. Uh, Tamir Rice, that happened under Obama. Corinne Gaines happened under Obama. And so not only was he a Democrat, he's a Black man, someone who we know was very sensitive to the issues of racial violence, of uh, uh, the issues between police and the, and the Black community. And yet still, under his leadership, we still had so many um, hashtags come about. And so I understand why people feel that it doesn't matter whether it's Democrat or Republican, because the issue is not who's president. The issue is that the system is rotten at its core. And that again, it has to be overhauled in order to make these changes. When you have a system that we understand in terms of policing that started during slavery as a part of the system to keep slaves in line, and that those some of those practices have not changed, there is no president that could come into office and do anything other than to say, we're going to tear it down and rebuild the system. Um, and so I get that frustration. But what we're looking at today in this particular president, who is, in my judgment, a fascist, 
who is, in my judgment, uh, a, a, his desire is to become a dictator in this country. And he is being supported by many individuals who are also, uh, in, in, in my opinion, uh, they do not have the best interests of those people who are the most disenfranchised and marginalized in this country. What we see happening at protests, where not only are police officers being extremely abusive to people who are literally saying, I just don't want to die and I want to see justice happen in this nation. But not only are we seeing uh, the police doing that, also the white militia has been out there on the ground, literally working with law enforcement in some places. And we saw what happened with Kyle Rittenhouse in Rochester where this man shot or this young boy shot and killed uh, two people and blew someone else's arm off and the president stood at the podium and said, you know, made excuses for this young man. And so when I, when I see these things happening, we have to understand that no Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are not the answer, but we know if they are not the answer, Donald Trump and Mike Pence and, and all of their cronies are absolutely not the answer. I would rather fight Kamala and Joe Biden. I would rather be able to get on the phone with people who are sensible, who I believe care about our issues and try to work through things with them, it's still means we got to get on the ground. We can't get out the streets. We have to continue to push them. But I do not believe that the current administration that we're working with is one that will change. I think it will get worse as they are unhinged at a point where they don't have an election to win again uh, in 2024. So I think that's the reason why people need to show up. The best way, there's one thing uh, not to participate and you don't know what will happen. Well, excuse me, to participate and not know what will happen. It's something else when you don't participate at all. We can be pretty sure at that point what will happen. I wanna leave you with a couple of questions that look ahead. Mm -hmm. Are you hopeful that Breonna Taylor's family will get justice and and what does that look like if so oh absolutely i mean i'm 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 hopeful that brianna taylor's family gets justice because justice for brianna means justice for me i see myself in her there are so many young women um who are starting their lives uh you know uh trying to make sure that they're going in the right direction uh, brianna was studying uh to become a nurse uh, and she was a beautiful young woman by all accounts and certainly by the love and grace that I have found in her family. Uh, if she was anything like the individuals uh, that I have met, she was a beautiful, beautiful young lady. Uh, and so justice for her is critically important, especially at this time in the movement when we feel like we have actually pushed the narrative so strong and so hard that many people who weren't at the table before are beginning to come to the table. But justice for Breonna Taylor also looks like a change to the ways that our system operates. It looks like an overhaul to the American justice system as it currently stands. Um, and so that's a long haul, yes, we want to see that a grand uh, that a new grand jury is impaneled and that a special prosecutor is put in place uh, that is not conflicted to present evidence to them on Breonna Taylor's death specifically. And so that's immediate justice. But long term, uh, justice for Breonna means justice for Black Americans and it means justice for Black women. Thank you, Tamika Mallory, for spending some time with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.